and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where team need to discuss everything health care. We are super excited to talk about the benefits of eating real food today. Uh, Dr. Jay Wrigley is having some technology problems logging on. Hopefully, we'll see him a little bit later. If not, Janet and I can discuss. But this is where Team Needham discusses everything about healthcare on Health Solutions Podcast. We are we have been doing this for let's see, almost five years now. We're going on our 500th episode coming up in October. Stay tuned for that. It will be a special edition. Um, And we're just super excited to be educating and empowering individuals to take charge of their own health. And that's what we've we've done at Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy for almost 26 years now, and we'll continue to do so. Um, So let's discuss the benefits of eating real food. First of all, Let's define what real food is, Janet. So real food means to me something that is close to the earth, um, that rots if it's not prepared or stored correctly. It's nothing out of a box. I do still think um, canned food or frozen food could qualify as this, but we're, t- we're talking things that grow from the earth or live on the earth. Yeah, and... If you think about how humans thrived for thousands of years, it was on real food. It was on the plants they could pick, the berries they could pick, the uh, fruit they could pick, the vegetables they could pick, um, and the meat they could eat, Um, whether it be fish that they fished for or whether it be animals they hunted. Um, so the further, the closer we can get back to how our ancestors ate. And when I mean ancestors, I don't mean our grandparents necessarily, because as we get further along in generations, eating bad has been a generational thing over the last three or four generations, really. It really started in the fifties. So many people's grandparents, um, you know, grew up in the seventies now, um, which is when I grew up. Um, so don't necessarily eat, eat how I grew up because, Um, I grew up with a lot of processed foods. Um, You know, go back a couple hundred years or even think about thousands of years. What did they do thousands of years ago? They they hunted, they fished, they ate um, plants when they could. Um, They could store some of the plants maybe if they canned them thousands of years ago. I don't think they had canning techniques, Um, but they did have some kind of preservative techniques. Um, So eat like our ancestors did. That being said... Red meat has been vilified since the 1960s, I think. And just think about that with our ancestors. If red meat was bad for humans, we would not be around because our ancestors thrived on red meat, whether it be um, dairy or whether it be uh, cattle, whether it be um, you know lamb, whether it be goats, whether it be deer, whether it be elk. Our ancestors thrived on red meat. Red meat is not bad for you. It is good for you. In fact, you cannot, I repeat this, you cannot eat too much red meat. So where we go wrong in our society is we've just made food way too convenient. Um, And, you know, Sean and I are just as guilty. There's times where, um, you know, you, you can't go to your pantry or your fridge to, or freezer to actually access food and make it. So you, you eat out. Um, And sometimes that is um, part of the life we live in. However, we can still make better choices as we travel or as we are at work and things like that. And and the reason we talk about uh, whole foods is because usually that's where our nutrients are coming from. Sometimes we do have to supplement for certain nutrients, but by far, most of our vitamins and minerals are going to come directly from our food sources. Um, So variety is important as well as balancing um, what our caloric needs are. Um, So what goes wrong with the processed foods is that it's so caloric dense. It's so um, full of just, uh, you might as well say almost powdered sugar because the sugar amounts in processed foods to make it taste better or uh, maybe last longer actually puts our body in a state of crisis because before we even get it into our stomach, you have the process in your mouth of digestion starting and our insulin just goes off the chart. And then by the time we've finished, you know, like for example, 
cereal. The big news now is the cereal companies making, you know, another cereal because it's, you know, an NFL players thought it would be a great, yeah. great thing to do. And, and I'm not, I'm not saying that they're trying to kill our children, but let's, let's face it. Most people can eat a ton of cereal versus eggs and bacon or eggs and sausage because we don't get the feeling in our stomach that we're full. Um, so the signal of being full to the brain is not happening. I mean, a good example of the cereal, I, I think cereal is just, it, it's just junk food. I mean, cereal is just the box kind of cereal is just junk food. And I don't care if it's, you know, non-sweetened cornflakes or if it's uh, cocoa pebbles, it's junk food. And here's a good example of the calorically dense uh, like Jan is talking about and nutrient dense and satiating. Let's talk about, let's compare cocoa pebbles to a steak. So cocoa pebbles, I believe it's been a long time since I've had a box of cocoa pebbles. I believe that a box of cocoa pebbles, if you remember, if anybody's ever eaten it and I grew up on that crap, um, it's, I think 11 ounces. Think about that. 11 ounces and you can eat a whole, you know, cause it's just mostly, Sugar and air, right? And you can eat a whole box, no problem. I can tell you this. I It's difficult for me to eat 12 ounces of red meat. Um, unless I'm really, really hungry, I cannot eat 12 ounces of red meat. When I weigh my food, it's almost magically, oh, there was 12 ounces, not surprised. So think, think about that. Junk food is just not satiating at all. Um, and did our did our ancestors hundreds of years ago eat cocoa pebbles? Absolutely not. They didn't have any of that processed garbage, um, and and they they thrived. There weren't diseases largely like type two diabetes. Uh, they didn't have a lot of the gastrointestinal diseases like like reflux, like ulcerative colitis. Um, all those things can be changed by your diet. And, and, and Jana is pharmacist. I mean, we, we know there's drugs to treat um, ulcerative colitis, but I don't necessarily believe in the drugs to treat them. I think, first of all, you need to look at diet. If you have any kind of problem with your intestinal tract, you need to change your diet. You don't lack a drug. There is no drug deficiency for reflux or for heartburn or for ulcerative colitis. Um, our bodies were created wonderfully if we give them the right inputs. Right. And so um, today on social media, one of the first things that I read was, and she's one of our followers, is why do I feel hungry throughout the day if I eat breakfast? Well, I think that answer of metabolism is different for each person. And I think we need to just kind of be very mindful of that. Um, I'll use my two kids for an example. Um, even from the time I carried them in the womb, I could tell a difference between the two individuals. My oldest man, when he's hungry, he's hungry and he's hungry now and he eats. My youngest, not so much. Um, so how you approach your um, diet depends on you as an individual. I personally don't eat very much in the morning. I usually stay away from food until later in the afternoon or evening, but that depends on activity too. So let's be realistic. If I'm at a desk job all day long, it's not the same as if I was working on a ranch or working in a factory where you're moving and lifting. So, you know, you have to keep those things in mind. So if that was the case for me, if I was doing activities, sure, I would eat breakfast. If I'm not, then I'm not going to. But that's my body. So let's let's be realistic. Everybody's caloric needs and nutritional needs are different. Dr. Jay Wrigley, welcome back to our show. Sean, good to see you again. Yes, nice, nice to have you on. So we were just starting our discussion about a real food. We kind of defined what real food is. Um, tell us a little bit about your history and, and why you're on our podcast today. Um, let, me, let, me, let me get that one more time because we had a little problem with audio for a second. The, Sean, the, so the question was what? Well, tell us a little bit about your history and yeah. um, why you're on our podcast today to talk about real food. No, that's easy to do. Um, for those of you who have not seen me and haven't seen uh, me and Sean and his beautiful wife, 
we all uh, talked together before, we share a common denominator, many. One is the interest in metabolic health and hormonal optimization. So I'm here, and my specialty is in uh, female hormonal optimization. I'm a uh, it's, I, I stumble a little bit with that question because now it's becoming so much more broad that I work with so many men. But in the past, you know, the nature of my business really was to help women who are going through the shift into peri and then menopause and whatnot understand why these hormonal uh, changes, landscape changes, were affecting things like. Um, why is it that I'm all of a sudden gaining weight and what I used to be able to do to drop 10 pounds easily does not work anymore at all and why am I more anxious and I don't sleep well or whatnot. So my specialty for 29 years has really been in female hormonal biochemistry. Now now that's kind of kind of partitioned itself into that there's not a whole lot of difference between what's going on with the middle-aged male who's going through you know, now these terms like andropause, where their hormones are beginning to, to decline. They're not you know, having the same output. And these hormones change everything about your metabolism. They, they run everything. Your metabolism, your moods, your sleep, your energy levels, how much... Your your body ability to do, to adapt to looks like we might. I know he's having some internet issues. Looks like we might have lost Doctor Wrigley. Um, as he Janet, you want to continue his discussion about how hormones affect our metabolism, kind of what you were talking about earlier, right? Well. Um, just to piggyback on what he said, uh, for most people, as we go through menopause or perimenopause, our body's in a huge shift. So everything that's working together as it did before is changing. And so that's why optim optimizing things back to um, a better place makes it better for women to transition. Um, he's, he mentioned sleep. That's huge. If we are sleeping better than our choices, as far as, um, just everyday choices become better, I think, because we think clearer, um, there's, there's several hormones, um, and, and he might jump into that, but, um, the biggest one that we usually look at is progesterone to get people sleeping, thyroid, estrogen, testosterone, DHEA. Um, but we have to remember insulin plays a big role in this. And since we're talking about whole food, um, if we are triggering our insulin production and our response is not uh, optimal, if we are resistant to our insulin, then all we do is store. Um, so that happens quite regularly with women that are going through menopause and even men for that matter for andropause is, um, or just triggering that insulin to keep uh, being produced. And so then we just keep storing and storing and storing. Storing what? Well, anything into fat is really what happens. And the hard part about this is during this process is usually it's more in the abdominal area as well as around our organs, which is not healthy. That's why it's, it's visceral fat. Right. So that's why it's really, um, something that needs to be addressed because if you have fat sitting around your organs, like Sean said, visceral fat, then, you know, chronic illnesses and diseases, um, become a part, unfortunately of, of your daily existence. And we want to avoid that because we, we live longer, we feel better. We have, you know, much more quality in our life. Um, and our life expectancy goes up with the less amount of, of gaining of that type of fat. And definitely a higher quality of life usually. So insulin is a hormone. It's a peptide hormone. Um, peptide meaning it has amino acid groups in it. And it is definitely a hormone. One of them, there, there's, when people think hormones, they think sex hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. But, you know, hormone is a very general term, very broad term. And insulin is definitely a hormone. So 
if insulin is bad, and let, let's just let's let me clarify that. I mean, we will die without insulin. Um, type one diabetics don't have um, don't make enough insulin, and they they die. They become emaciated because they can't take up glucose into their cells. So they they literally starve to death. Um, so we will die without insulin. But what what has happened over the last? century or so or at least the last 50 or 60 years is we just most of us have too much insulin floating around and i will tell you this the, the, i will say this if there is one test that you can do to check your metabolic health check your fasting insulin that 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 is probably the most important indicator of metabolic health in my opinion uh, as far as the test goes i mean the best indicator of metabolic health is the mirror in my opinion you can just look at somebody and see if they're metabolically healthy so if somebody's insulin is high, then Janet, what do you do about it if, if, if um, their insulin is um, high? Well, there's several things that you need to look at. First of all, um, when we approach um, helping women and men with their changes, we, we address sleep because if you're not sleeping, again, your choices aren't well, your body's not healing. Um, and then usually we look at the different hormones for men and women. Testosterone is huge because that helps with rebuilding muscle and maintaining muscle mass. Um, and, you know, we're not talking about the bodybuilder or the gym rat situation. We're just talking about optimal levels that help improve your body's ability to rebuild muscle tissue, connective tissue. Um, so if we can do that, then obviously somebody's metabolism is increased as well as making sure their thyroid gland is, is, is working properly. Because if that's not happening, then of course, then that's going to trigger another cascade of just storing versus actually, um, burning that, uh, caloric intake. So thyroid and testosterone hormone can help to um, normalize insulin levels. What does, what does food have to do with this, Janet? Can you just take testosterone sure. and thyroid not to worry about what you no, eat? Not at all. So they're all pieces of the puzzle. Um, you know, our society and our healthcare, sick care model always just looks at compartments. Um, basically, if you went in for something, it's pretty much your doctor's checking the box on his computer. But let's be realistic. We're an organism. Everything matters. Everything communicates with one. Um, so if you keep triggering the response of um, more sugar, more sugar, more sugar um, in the types of foods that you're choosing, i.e. processed rather than real raw foods, um, then you keep telling your body, hey, I need more insulin. Well, it gets overwhelmed. It doesn't know how, what to do because if the cells can't take the, the glucose inside to, to work, then all it says is store, 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 store. Um, so if we keep adding processed food to our diet, i.e. we were talking cocoa puffs, but it could be, it could be a number of different things. If we keep doing that to our body, it's, it's in this, what we call metabolic resistance. We're metabolically ill. Um, we're just in a state of stress because our body's saying, help, I, I don't know what to do. And, and really it's from too much glucose flowing around your right. blood. Um, and your body says, okay, I need to take that glucose and, and put it somewhere in the body. So it releases insulin to, to take the glucose out of the blood. But your body shouldn't have high glucose all the time. No. Um, and so one of the ways to lower your glucose and hence lower your insulin levels is to fast. Just don't eat. And, and if you think about ancestrally speaking, thousands of years ago, think about how our ancestors ate. Um, I mean, there were times where literally they didn't eat besides very small meals that they might have picked some berries and stuff like that, but to, to, not enough to sustain themselves. Um, they didn't eat for days. Um, then they would hunt and they would eat pretty well for a couple days and then they wouldn't eat for days. Um, our body was used to fasting. And proof of that is, is we're good at storing fat. That's why most Americans are fat because we're good at storing fat um, for when we weren't, when we didn't have food in front of us. Now, unfortunately, most Americans 
and I'm going to just almost say all Americans, I don't use words like that very often, but almost all Americans, we have an ax, an unlimited access to food, especially when we get home. I mean, if you look at what we have access to at home, whether it's in our freezer, whether it's in our fridge, even if it's good food, even if it's real food, like we've been talking about, we have access to unlimited food and that can be a problem. Um, so fasting, fasting will lower your blood sugar and lower your insulin levels. And anybody that's a type two diabetic, if you want to, if you want to see if type two diabetes is reversible, fast for 24 hours and see what happens to your glucose. And if any doctor tells you that fasting is dangerous, get a new doctor. Yeah. And I think one of the things that uh, we follow um, a fitness coach and Kathy Cotea, she talks about your macros and different things like that. Well, I agree with her. We need to have the, the big parts of our nutrition. But the other part that's missing is serving sizes. Because even in countries like Hong Kong and Jap Japanese countries, they may still have a McDonald's and they may stay go might go to it. But they don't supersize everything like how we do. And they also are very mobile. They're, even though they live in, in cities, they walk more than we do. They move more than we do. So I think proportion sizes uh, for whether it be a drink or your meal is just overlooked a lot. So if you're not sure, I don't, I don't run around with the scale, but, you know, figure out how much a serving really is because a lot of times when we are using the processed food, if you look at the back of it and the ingredients, many times it's like 20 different ingredients versus one or two. And on top of it, the serving size of that little container says one or two. Well, if it's two, then, you know, if the serving size is 180 of calories and you ate the whole bag, that's, that's 360 calories right there. So it's really deceiving. And then we add things in our society called like Coca-Cola or our drinks from Starbucks. And those things, if you measured out how much sugar was in each serving, it is unreal. I mean, Sean and I grew up at the time where um, Kool-Aid, if you ever made Kool-Aid from the package and actually saw how much sugar went <laughs> into that, I mean, that's kind of the same concept that I'm trying to, to relate is that, you know, don't, don't fill yourself with liquid sugar all day long. Um, and that will help with your metabolism too, because you're just dumping, dumping sugar where your body is just screaming. I don't know what to do with it. So all it can do is store. And, and let's compare real food to a can of Coca-Cola. Right. Real, a can of Coca-Cola has as much sugar as 15 oranges. I dare anybody to eat 15 oranges. But how many cans of Coke could you drink? I can drink uh, three, four uh, in a row, no problem. Um, that's why I just don't buy it because I, I would drink it. Um, so real food is just satiating. Here's another thing Janet talked about. Um measuring food or weighing food. And I, and I mentioned that a little bit too for, for portion control. Let me tell you this. I, I think that can be important and it's a good tool. Kind of like if you measure your calories, I think it's good for you to do that for, and maybe for indefinitely, if, if that's what you do, I used to measure my calories and I would track them and I would weigh my food. And after you weigh your food a few times, you can kind of tell what portion sizes are. So you don't have to weigh it as, as much anymore because um, you can tell what you know, six, it's six ounces of steak or whatever. And then you can track your calories. I don't track, I haven't been tracking my calories for over a year now. I tracked it for about five or six years, very religiously. Um, I don't do it anymore. And here's, I kind of know what to eat. I know, I know when I haven't eaten good. I know when I've eaten well, e eaten well. Here's the thing. If you eat real food, after you get good at it, and if you focus on real food, you don't need to track your calories. I mean, Think about this. Think about what our ancestors did. When our ancestors killed a deer or, you know, whatever animal it was in the wild, did they say, well, I wonder how much protein this has in it? You know, and I know we talk about maximizing our protein a lot. And, and I think that's important. But if you eat real food, especially focus on meat, you will maximize your protein. And you don't have to worry about macros. They'll just fall into place. Um, our ancestors didn't say, well, how much carbohydrates does this have in it? Or how much, you know, how much fat? I, no, 
Not at all. I mean, they just ate it. Um, and I think that's a good example of why you really don't have to um, track your macros. You really don't have to um, weigh your food if you eat the right things. Right. Um, but I think you need to know what that means. Correct. That's the problem. Um, many times people forget, you know, hey, I didn't. I didn't count this. I didn't count that. I didn't count this and I didn't count that. And they just, um, mindlessly, I mean, I, I see people at work all the time. They're mindlessly having snacks. They're mindlessly eating. And that's not, um, that's not what we're meant to do. Um, I think like Sean, um, um, indicated is that our ancestors would sit down and actually eat yeah. together. Um, so it wasn't just about the food it was gathering. Um, and also um, we have this obsession. I think that we're not going to have enough food because we've been told, you know, if, uh, like we grew up, we wouldn't have enough farmers to, to have food on the table. So, you know, we went crazy and we made all these processed things that are in the middle aisle. So, um, our approach when we actually go to the grocery store is we do the perimeter. Um, we stay away from the inside aisles as much as we can. And the other point I want to make is, and I hear this all the time, is everybody seems to want to tell the story that fresh food and real foods are really expensive and they're not able to um, purchase them. Well, um, we live in a, a, a smaller community where we have farmers around us and there's wonderful farmers markets. I mean, we've had several pharmacy students that came through and that's how they shop. They went on Wednesday or Friday or, or Saturday to the farmer's market to get their real produce. And that happens around us. So just look. Um, and usually those things are much cheaper than even the grocery store. But here's, here's what I also tell people, you know, those boxes of cereal are super expensive and they do not serve as much as a carton of eggs. And if you don't believe me, try it, try seeing how many eggs you can eat versus boxes of cereal. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's, it, there's no comparison. And the other point I like to make to people is this is not just um, your food budget. This is also your health budget. Let's, let's be real about it. You're investing in healthy foods, you will have usually healthier outcomes. The more you clean that up, you know, the less likely you're going to be sick. If you do get sick, you heal faster. If you break something, you heal faster. We age better. Our brains are healthier. I mean, we went through this whole, Sean and I went through this whole society kick of no cholesterol, absolutely no cholesterol in your diet. No well, saturated we, fat. We make more than what our diet adds. I think it's not just the cholesterol that was the problem. It was all the sugar. And so we went through, oh my gosh, low fat, as low fat as you can have, more carbs, more carbs. And right now we're in this phase where even our government is saying, oh, kids need more sugar. That's the last thing that kids and adults need in our country. When 74% of Americans are overweight, overweight or obese and our children are about 50%, what we've been doing in the last three decades is insane. It's insane. It's called insanity. We keep repeating the same thing over and over again. So let's get back to the real food, um, which actually I think tastes better <laughs> in a lot of ways. And, you know, I mean, we don't have to drink that. Let's drink water. Water's good for us. And let's go back into the pricing comparison. I'll use the Cocoa Pebbles and... Um, beef analogy. I don't know how much a box of Cocoa Pebbles is, but um, it's easy to eat a box of Cocoa Pebbles. I'm guessing a box of Cocoa Pebbles now is going to be around $5. Um, I, we just bought 18 eggs yesterday and you can get them a little bit cheaper if you um, buy them in the 60 count. Um, and you can really get eggs for 10 cents each probably well think about that how many eggs can you if you buy them in quantities you can eat you can um get eggs for 10 cents uh, an egg so how many eggs can you actually eat i mean when i'm really hungry i can eat three um so eating healthy is is inexpensive don't 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 buy the lie um and i don't necessarily when we talk about grass-fed beef or organic and Here's my opinion of that. I think organic, and we, we had a podcast just dedicated to organic farming. 
And here's my opinion about that. If, if it makes you feel better, great. And, and I do think there's something to be said about grass-fed beef, but it is more expensive. Um, here's the thing. When it comes to toxins in our body, whether it be the endocrine disruptors, we talk about plastics, we talk about um, you know glyphosates and stuff with, with the chemicals on, our, on, on, on vegetables and stuff versus organic. Here's what I will say. First of all, get the big points first, okay? Eat better, stay away from junk food, eat real food, eat whole foods, sleep right, and move. And your body will be more prepared to detox yourself. We're going to be hit with toxins no matter what we do. Our body is designed pretty well. We have a liver, livers and kidney, our liver and kidney is designed to eliminate toxins. If we keep our bodies healthy, we can do that better. So just before you worry too much about the details of organic versus grass-fed beef, just eat real food in the first place, right? Oh, that's a really good point. So, I mean, I I help women um, throughout the day, counsel them on their hormones and help them to get them optimized. But just remember, all these pieces are important. Today, we're talking about food, and that's super important. So sometimes we do need to supplement um, our society is very low in, in, in methylating our uh, B vitamins, so you might need to supplement with that. But just remember, supplements and vitamins are just an augmentation to They're a supplement. Health. That's why we call them supplements. Right. They're just part of it. And, and vitamin D, where we live, unlike where the doctor is in Fiji, um, vitamin D up north in the northern latitudes is really important. Um, so all these things play into the, our, our overall health, but get your food right first and just do one thing at a time. I mean, don't, don't overwhelm yourself. Just start slow. I mean, we, we eliminated things one thing at a time and, and rarely, rarely do we, um, add to our pantry. It's mostly our refrigerator. Or freezer. Or freezer. Our freezer is usually full. We go through a, a full beef every four months. Um, we have two boys that are six men. three six they don't yeah. like boys. <laughs> <laughs> they're men they're six three and six four my oldest is six four and he just told me the other day he hit 260 for the first time and, and he's he's ripped i mean he's he's big and muscular and so and one of the things is they, they don't live with us and they're independent um but we do allow them to raid our freezer and our, our the meat goes pretty fast which if, if that's what we can give them is good, healthy meat, then that's, that's, that's awesome. I want them to be healthy in that, in that um, arena. Speaking of that, one of my friends who's also a fellow rogue pharmacist and understands that drugs are not the answer to most chronic diseases, um, speaking of pricing on um, real food, he just posted that ground beef was two ninety nine a pound at Winco. I think it was Winco. two ninety nine a pound. Think about that. Two ninety nine a pound. Most people should not probably be eating a pound of ground beef at a fitting, um, unless they're uh, less sedentary, unless they're moving a lot more. But for most sedentary Americans, eight ounce of ground beef is probably even more than enough. I think a, a serving of ground beef is four ounces, but depends on what else you eat with it. But think about that: a dollar if you ate eight ounces of ground beef. It's a dollar fifty. If you did that three times a day, it's four dollars and fifty cents. Do I think that you can thrive on ground beef alone? Yes, I do. I absolutely do. Um, and it's you know, a carnivore type diet is one of the least inflammatory diets around. Nobody is allergic to red meat. There, there's a few cases, but it's very, very far and few between. And just remember, those animals were created to take grass and plants and concentrate them with all those nutrients that are in the plants, concentrate them in their own meat. So we were made to eat those animals. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Um, let's hit really quick, Janet, as we wind this podcast up. Why are foods, why are real foods important even when people take hormones? Let's talk about the building blocks. Um, and right. Well, we, um, <clears throat> we indicated earlier about testosterone helping to, to build muscles, but the, the way our body utilizes um, 
proteins is it helps to rebuild tissue. Um, fat as well is important. So we vilified fat. Well, our brain requires cholesterol. That's part of our makeup. If we don't have enough cholesterol, our brain is not being fed. So we need those nutrients to take the tissue and rebuild it the same way with bones. We need certain things in our body to make the bones. So it's not just filling your stomach and making you feel good. It's rebuilding the tissue from the ground up and they all work together, um, whether it be your hormones or the nutrients. Um, but we need those amino acids. We need those essential fats. We need those, um, things to happen in order for our body to get the signal that, Hey, I have this on hand and I can actually, you know, repair that muscle or build new muscle. And a good analogy of this is let's say a contractor on a house. There's a contractor building a house. Testosterone is like the contractor. Okay. But the contractor needs wood to build the house. So if you don't have the real food to build the tissue, right? It doesn't matter that you have testosterone. So it's a great analogy. Um, and, and really, I think if we break this down, we've talked about this before in our podcast. And I always want to end up with this. There are, I alluded to it earlier. There are literally three things we can do to keep our body healthy. And you focus on these things before worrying about a lot of the details. But focus on sleep, diet, and exercise and that diet should include real food. If it doesn't rot, don't eat it. Whole foods, shop the perimeter, just like we were talking about today. Focus on those things first and, and that will optimize 90% of your health. Um, and then worry about a lot of the details later. Um, don't, don't get too worked up about the details. And I, I say those in order specifically. Sleep trumps everything. If you're not sleeping, your body can't repair itself. So sleep is more important than diet. Uh, we will die without food before we'll die without sleep. And of we course, will die with sleep. Without we will die without sleep before we'll die without food. Sorry, thanks for correcting me. Okay. And um, exercise is one of the least important. Most people think exercise is the most important, but we don't have to exercise to stay alive. We have to eat and sleep to stay alive. Now, I'm not saying that exercise isn't important, but you can't exercise your way out of a poor diet and you will never get the benefits of exercise if you're not sleeping. So just remember those three things. Um, what else, Janet, as we wind this podcast up? Well, don't make it hard. One step at a time. I think that's the biggest thing about our culture is we want instant gratification and we want it to be overnight, but it's just small steps at a time. And each decision builds up over time. So the more you can be more consistent. And I have had friends tell me that they just cleaned out their pantry and got rid of anything that was in a box. Well, start simple. Just don't rebuy it. Just don't take it home. You know, just use simple steps. Um, and over time, it adds up. So don't make it hard on yourself. Just do one step at a time. Don't drink your calories. That's probably that's over there. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. We do have a comment here. Sir, can you recommend some food to get rid of skin acne? Janet, would you talk about that? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. The, the foods that I would recommend is protein. I, I will tell you, if you want to get rid of most chronic disease, um, and, and I don't eat 100% carnivore um, because I'm metabolically healthy, so I don't have to worry about it. But if you want to get rid of type 2 diabetes, you want to get rid of hypertension, you want to get rid of acne, you want to get rid of most chronic disease, ulcerative colitis, headaches, you're having any kind of chronic disease like that, go carnivore. That's exactly what I would do. And here's, and here's a website um, I can show you. Dr. Sean Baker, we've interviewed him a couple times on the carnivore diet. And um, he has been eating um, strictly carnivore. I, I say that loosely because he has cheated a few times. He has shared that. Um, but here's, here's Dr. Baker. Um, just uh, Google Dr. Sean Baker uh, or carnivore diet. And that is a way to get rid of a lot of chronic disease. Do that for 90 days and, and see how those diseases progress. Remember, you know, Jen and I are two pharmacists that don't believe in medications to treat most chronic disease. That's very powerful coming from two pharmacists. Um, so 
that also means that most of this stuff can be controlled by diet. You know, headaches, ulcerative colitis, blood pressure. You don't lack a drug. You know, that's not the way your body was created. So just remember that. Our diet is important. Focus on real food. Also, remember to follow us. Uh, we stream live on Facebook. We stream a, a LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. Um, please go follow the, follow us there. Share this. Um, comment. Let us know what other topics you'd like to, like to hear or see. Um, we really appreciate all of our listeners and viewers, and we are looking forward to our 500th episode. And um, that's about it. Uh, we, we really enjoy doing this podcast, and our goal is podcast, as always, is to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own health. So thank you for tuning in today. Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you.